we will be building on the work that all of these folks have done uh, and trying to build our connections with all of you as well for our next steps forward. So Hai Dong Liang has recently taken over as the Executive Director at West End Seniors Activity Centre. Now I know what happened. Hai Dong. Good afternoon, my name is Hai Dong. I'm the Executive Director of West End Seniors Activity Centre. So uh, I'm just going to tell you um, why we, what kind of changes we have made and why. So uh, when we're doing this project, so that's the first time actually as a not-for-profit organization we see, we see this much, this large amount of money to do social marketing. So for us, we care about, we don't want to just waste money, we want to make it sustainable. And that's the reason at the beginning, like when I was spending money on commercials, I just love it, right? Like because it's so powerful. But then I said, no, I need to use some money to build on that sustainability. And that's why we switched that to the digital. Uh, according to research, still like 30% of Canadians will be reached by social media or digital platform. And that's the rationale behind that. We decided to focus our focus on that. And then for the... Um, Community Connector program, at the beginning we have our uh, community uh, ambassador and gatekeeper program. We're still using that, we're still uh, working with uh, organizations like M to Mindernet Center for Newcomers. They, they have a lot of great uh, community connectors, but at the same time we realized we need to expand our reach to businesses, senior serving businesses. So I have built this program, it's called Community Connector Program. And last Wednesday, actually, we just had our first uh, launch and we had over 40 businesses attended our event. It was a great success and they're providing a lot of support to our center. And I welcome you to visit our website and see what kind of presentation uh, those organizations are providing. It's the frontline seniors serving information and there's no sales, no product they're selling and that's the bottom line. I'm not trying to create problem or barriers for seniors. I would just want them to access to the information. Next slide please. And moving forward, that's ex exactly what we're gonna do. Just um, as a community hub, my vision is we want to be a virtual and physical hub for seniors. So look, thanks to this project and thanks to all the partners, we have this capability to really build that information hub. So anytime, so for example, sometimes I need help, I could just phone Heather and say, Heather, get, send me something. And then she will send me stuff. And then with that organization, Shannon, I would say, Shannon, can we work on some projects? And yeah, they say we'll work together. But that information will be disseminated through our platform to seniors. And then for the uh, Business Community Connector program, again, I mean, like, uh, um, I welcome you to visit our website or speak to me and uh, let's work on that together. And that's my goal. Like, we're not just serving seniors as an individual organization. We should all work together, partner together to address that. And just one thing I want to mention for some of the grants I've been searching for lately especially the federal level grant, they're talking about multi-sector. So multi-sector, so it cannot be just non-for-profit and non-for-profit. It should be non-for-profit organization with businesses, with education institutes, with government, with university, with just with everybody. So we all need to work together because the senior population ahead of us, nobody in this world can even handle that. Thanks. Okay, <clears throat> a year ago, Shannon Gill was hired as the Executive Director for Drive Happiness. Thanks, Tim. Uh, when I took over at Drive Happiness, uh, we had been working on a project uh, for on-demand transportation, and the original format for this was to create a smartphone app for seniors to be able to basically be an Uber for seniors. We very quickly realized that working with low resource seniors, an app wasn't something that they were comfortable with. 
And so that, I scratched that and we moved to a different model where we used our current uh, technology infrastructure. We have a great ride scheduling program and we used that as the backbone, but it was a one-on-one -on -one between our dispatching staff and the senior themselves that really made the senior feel comfortable about using our service, that made them feel like we knew what we were doing and we could connect them to caring, passionate volunteers who were willing to drive them safely wherever they wanted to go and whenever they wanted to do it. And so that really became our learning point was technology is great, but you need to have that one-on-one -on -one connection with seniors to make them feel comfortable with what it is you're doing. Just technology on its own is not uh, something that, that works well for a, a large part of the senior population. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see that change as our, you know, my generation gets older and we're comfortable with using apps and everything else. We'll see that, techno that technology take a more uh, prevalent role, but right now, the seniors right now, are not comfortable enough um, for it not to be a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I'm completely getting off topic here. <laughs> um, for some of our seniors, our staff may be the only person they talk to that day, and having that one-on-one -on -one is what's critical for them. Uh, as word spread about our services, multiple senior serving organizations, caseworkers, medical personnel staff started referring more complex cases to Drive Happiness, and that's where this partnership really uh, became critical. We have uh, referred people to SAGE when they've had, uh, for example, a hoarding situation that we discovered. Uh, we connected them with the SAGE hoarding program. We've connected people with housing at GEF. We've got them involved in West End Senior Activities or the Senior Center Without Walls. Uh, we provided transportation for the EMCN seniors who needed to get out. So transportation really is the hub of all of this and that's the other thing we've learned is without transportation you can have fabulous programs but if you can't get the seniors who are socially isolated and most at risk to them it doesn't help um, so having people who are identifying those people and then referring them to our transportation so that we can, they can get them out to the programming has been another key part of this partnership we are currently serving approximately 700 seniors and this year we estimate that we will do 18,000 rides all on volunteer drivers. Our drivers will have driven over 200,000 kilometers and donated 20,000 volunteer hours this year. Um, so it's, it's fantastic what we've been able to accomplish with this Pegasus uh, grant or the, the New Horizons for Seniors grant. Uh, before this grant we were doing about 3,000 rides a year for about 190 seniors. So the growth has been phenomenal over the last uh, three years of this grant and we're really hoping that this grant will help us continue to roll that out. Uh, we've been now approached by many uh, communities outside of Edmonton that are looking to bring our services to them and so we're hoping that this uh, new round of the grant would allow us to uh, start moving our services out. But as I mentioned, one of the partnerships that has uh, really worked very well together was uh, with the Edmonton Mennonite Youth Center for Newcomers. And I'm going to invite Linda uh, to come up and talk a little bit uh, with me about this. Uh, so what we did was, as I said, Drive Happiness provided the transportation and uh, your community connectors were the ones that really helped get your seniors connected with us and helped us get all the rides booked. So I'll let you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so initially it was very helpful for us um, to have a partner organization like Drive Happiness available to us because um, what we were doing... It, the mic. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> sorry. Okay, so initially it was really helpful for us to have a partner organization like Drive Happiness available to us as we were working to help um, work with, specifically with immigrant seniors. We do a lot of work with immigrants overall, but we haven't had a very senior specific focus prior mm -hmm. to this program. And what we discovered really early on was that we had this great program we wanted seniors to come to, but there needed to be a um, relationship built first, trust needed to be established. Um, and that wasn't just trust, like that I trust you as a human being to like provide good service, but also trust to leave the house, that it's safe to get out. And so working with Drive Happiness allowed us to um, 
ensure that seniors and their family members felt safe, allowing their, um, their older adults in their lives join our programming. Um, so that was like the big connecting point for us with EMCN, or and Drive Happiness. <laughs> and then uh, beyond that, um, so we realized that we also need to be realistic in like the, the amount of time and energy that it takes for seniors to become comfortable with engaging um, the broader community. So we, we were able to kind of move our English classes that we were using as the, as the platform to bring seniors out and we were able to start doing more community events. So we took them on multiple field trips. The English class became learning the language you need to go take the ETS and then we would go on the ETS together. Um, teaching community connectors, having the opportunity to work with the seniors to learn um, mm -hmm. how to read bus routes, do practice around getting to and from the doctor's office and those types of things. So um, we were able to provide individualized support uh, which included teaching seniors how to use the technology so that they could have a greater independence in the long run. So what was really important was that we were able to develop deep and rich connections. Um, and Drive Happiness drivers were integral to that. I know many of our seniors enjoyed um, practicing their English that they were learning at English class with the drivers on their way to and from mm -hmm. class. And so it also helped them feel connected to the community because um, Sometimes the seniors were feeling like maybe they weren't welcome, but when they had people of their age demographics chatting with them in the cars on the way to and from class, they knew that they were welcomed, at least by that, that person or that part, part of, our, of our community. Um, and the other thing that we found really helpful with this partnership was working with um, the South Primary Care Network in their Senior Centers Without Walls, which you'll hear more about later. But, through that um, connection, we were able to help seniors practice using the phone. Um, it's one thing to use the phone uh, for you and I, it's another thing to learn how to use a smartphone, and then it's another thing to be learning English, and then another layer is learning to use a smartphone in English, um, or maybe the app on the phone, like it just, the layers really build up. and so. Um, what we were noticing is that seniors were able to engage in like maybe one-to-one -one conversations face-to-face, -face, but when they would go to say maybe book a ride or um, figure out how to get to the, like book a doctor's appointment, that language that they knew in class just evaporated. And so the practice of using the phone was very integral to um, now we are seeing some seniors being able to book things like DATS by themselves or get out into the community on their own. Um, so I just want to really emphasize that the, the human connection is very important um, to any, any uh, technological movements that we make, especially for the generation of, like the current generations of seniors. And one thing also that we need to remember in terms of immigrant seniors particularly, is that it doesn't matter how long you've been here, um, how good your English is, uh, as you age, it becomes sometimes harder and harder to use a second or third language. Um, and when you have a mental health concerns such as dementia or stuff, um, setting in, the language that they did know um, sometimes does go away. And so there's always going to be a demand for that um, supportive connection for immigrants in particular. Um, we we see that as the, the larger centers are filling, we're seeing more and more immigrants moving to the Edmonton area. And as our population ages, I think this is something that we cannot neglect, is to consider what the um, needs of aging immigrant seniors is. So uh, what we hope to do is to continue to be that conduit between maybe mainstream serving organizations, uh, senior serving organizations, and um, immigrant seniors in particular, so that we can help kind of be that um, translator for the mainstream and the immigrant to help them be able to uh, access the resources, to learn that resources exist, and also for the mainstream serving organizations to be able to uh, respond appropriately to the needs 
um, and desires of the immigrant organized, uh, immigrant seniors. Um, thanks. Thank you, Linda. And Heather Duran from the Edmonton Southside PCN Senior Centers Without Walls. So a senior center without walls is maybe not the most intuition-based name. Um, what we're offering is basically a senior center that can be accessed entirely over the phone. And when I say that, a lot of people go, oh, really? You know, are you just ch chatting? What is going on there? And I would say that there's some unexpected benefit to having services be accessible by phone. One is it is a pretty ubiquitous technology. Most seniors have tech, a telephone and know how to use it and are quite comfortable using it, especially in the low-income demographic. We played with the idea of using a webinar or a video-based, and it really, at this point, the demographics are not supporting that, but it is always an option. We've heard some wonderful feedback running over the last two years around the really human experiences of our seniors who are joining us. For some of our folks, they join us multiple times every day throughout the week. They would be there if we ran things from morning to night. And this is mainly because for some, this is their only source of contact. This is not just one-on-one -on -one calls, so that is a component of the program. This is bringing together groups of seniors into a program style. Some of these are conversations, some are just for fun, but all of them try and really recognize that uniqueness of each person and their importance. At the end of the day, we are a telephone line, and it's the participants that make us what we are and really bring the richness to our program. They do feel very connected with staff, and but the more important thing is that they feel connected with one another. The other day, the term blind friendship came up. And when I said, oh, it's because you can't see each other, they went, no, it's because they're friends with me with no judgment. They can't tell that I'm looking not so great today or that I'm really not doing well health-wise. They just were happy to chat with me today. So what changed in our program? Well, we really did want to focus on that personal component. When we first started, we thought we'll run a couple programs a week and that'll be that. But when we really started working with our folks, we started realizing they didn't know where else to go. They didn't know about the other resources. And we really wanted to make sure we knew the information to meet their needs. We've always really tried to tailor our programming to the needs of our participants. And the only way you can do that is by listening to them and really getting to know them. And now we have a very active advisory group, which comes up with wonderful decisions and wonderful ideas. And we are in the great position to be able to say, sure, why not, most of the time. A big part of that was around geographical range as well. We started and we said Edmonton. And that was working fantastic. We were getting lots of calls from folks in Edmonton. And then the calls from areas outside of Edmonton started coming in, saying, I don't have anything in my community. I don't have any transportation. I don't have any of this. Where, what do I do? Can I, can I join? And luckily for us, geography is not an issue. It costs the exact same amount of money as if someone's joining from Medicine Hat as from two blocks down from our building. And really for the participants, they can't tell the difference. And, but something that came out of collaboration was this idea of specific programming for different subpopulations. As we started talking with partners, we really started identifying these groups of seniors who may need a little extra help, you know, and some of that came out of, you know, conversations with EMCN about the newcomer challenge and the particular challenge of using the phone in English. So we created a phone program to practice your English, you know, talking about the lack of awareness of services in our community. So we got... GEF and SAGE to do talks for us about the services that they provide. There is nothing better than I like when some, I call someone because I haven't heard from them in a while and they say, 
oh, well, I just moved into this great new GEF building after the talk, and I love it so much, and I, I have too much on my plate now, and I'm so busy, and I love everything. And that's the best case scenario in our minds. If, no, if they don't need us for that reason, I'm perfectly happy with that. Another person got in touch with Drive Happiness and went on their way out and about and joining an in-person community. So what has this actually resulted in? It's really allowed us to benefit not just from our own resource awareness, but also from program development with all these partners. There are only two staff people working on this project, and if they listen to us every day, all day, they get very bored of us very quickly. So bringing in lots of partners and being able to do that. Lots of new program ideas, such as exercise over the phone, meditation and relaxation techniques, you can think of it, we probably can try and do it. And ultimately, these are all around sustainability. By having more partners involved, we can really spread the cost and the capacity requirements. We can access funds from both health and community sectors, and we can better serve those rural communities. But we really are excited about the potential of opening it up to peer and intergenerational volunteerism. Not just as a way to bolster our own program, but to really foster some of that self-efficacy within the population and opportunities for shared wisdom. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> um, Shanika Donalds was hired as the project lead with uh, the Greater Edmonton Foundation. She went off to have a baby a year ago, and um, Cheryl Akamenko has been working hard in her stead and is now the manager of their community supports. Hello. Um, GF's initial examination, sorry, GF's initial examination indicated um, that the need was great to reach isolated seniors who are living in our buildings. Um, and we could not only reach, or sorry, we could not only provide service to a select segment of our population, we needed to find those isolated seniors. So having identified the need, we sought resources both inside and outside of the collective to assist us in meeting the needs. Our team is small, we only have two social workers on the team, but we have a potential pool of 3,600 clients on any given day. Um, we found we needed to work more collaboratively with partner agencies to serve our seniors. And one example of this is um, that we recognize that SAGE have expertise in working with seniors with hoarding tendencies. So we work closely with the outreach workers of the this full house program that Bernice will talk about as well. Um, but by working collaboratively with SAGE on referred client cases, GF has been successful in reducing or completely eliminating the risk of eviction for a senior in their home. GF can, provide, can now provide follow-up support and consult with SAGE outreach workers even after the senior um, has completed the This Full House program. <coughs> Sorry. So we had to develop creative mechanisms and partnerships with members of the collective to cope with some of the issues of our client group. So now we regularly meet with, this, with SAGE social workers um, from the full, this full house program to update each other on shared clients and ensure that those seniors are being supported effectively. Um, having the other partners um, that we've just talked about come out to meet with the seniors and give presentations um, at the seniors' home in their lodge or the apartment has also helped build awareness in the GF communities of all the services that are available to them. So at the end of the funding, we, continue, we will continue to offer community support to our residents within the GF buildings, and we're actively working to identify mechanisms to fund the program going forward. So we recognize that working together with other organizations to meet the seniors' needs is essential to reaching the isolated seniors and overall increasing their quality of life. Bernice Sewell is the Director of Operations for SAGE, and she's been the project lead from the outset of their project. Thanks, Tim. Um, so I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, what our findings have been. Uh, as Tim had mentioned earlier, we had 3.5 positions 
to work and find isolated seniors in the community. So as you've actually heard from everyone who spoke before me, the needs of isolated seniors and the faces of isolated seniors could look very different. And that was some of our interesting insights as well as we worked. So it helped to shape how we did the work after the first short period of time. Uh, our findings have been that the reasons for seniors experiencing isolation really may vary. Well, some might be isolated due to a, one incident, so perhaps losing uh, a spouse after a number of years, or perhaps moving to a new environment. The other reasons for isolation may be very complex. So we have found that um, they might be experiencing isolation due to the intersection of many factors, being mental health, other health issues, poverty, family dynamics, and mobility issues. And with this information, we recognized that we probably uh, needed to provide services in very different ways. So we have services for those seniors that might have an isolated incident where they can come and chat with someone, find the resources, uh, maybe meet a couple of times, and then get connected. But we also have the community navigators who are working with those really complex cases whereby they might be meeting with a senior for six or eight months or longer to deal with all of the complexities prior to even being able to think about meeting um, and becoming attached to other social resources. Um, and it's been very beneficial having the other agencies because even in that then sometimes we could connect them to the senior center without walls so they didn't have to leave their home but perhaps talk to someone. There was another group that we became aware of um, that were staying in their homes because they weren't certain of where to go and they didn't feel that they had anything to contribute to their community. An example of that might be um, men. We've always known within the senior centers that we always had more women who came to the centers. There were less men that came. Uh, we believed it was because perhaps men socialized differently. But what we'd also heard from men in the community was that so much of their identity is tied up into the work, their employment, and that when they retire, they really feel lost and without a purpose. We also know that depression is a huge issue for men, especially older men. Uh, so by going into the communities and helping to initiate conversations with seniors, a number of community-based seniors initiatives are beginning to take shape. One of those is the Men's Sheds Initiative, which at this time, the city can boast of having five such programs initiated through this Pegasus project. So our learnings over the past three years have led us to believe that there is a need for a multiple pronged approach and a, a variety of services. We know we have seniors in the community who, if they believe they had things to offer and that those, that if they believe that they had things to offer and that those skills would be valued, they would join in the communities to share those gifts, to continue learning, continue sharing those skills and to connect with others. We also know that there are those seniors who are isolated due to those many issues that they're facing in their lives which seem like insurmountable barriers. We believe that if you have someone out available to support them, to assist with system navigations and, con and connections, they may be able to live the life that they wish. We know that we need to collaborate with other organizations as we've shown by this project because I, we don't believe that one organization can have the expertise needed, nor all the resources that they need to, to have such an impact in the community. One of the other learnings that we've had is that it was important to have the backbone organization, uh, such as ESCC served for us within this project, uh, because they assisted with the collaborative efforts that were essential to the success of the project and helping to streamline those efforts. Thank you. So, 
<clears throat> all my pan-Canadian projects are looking for the same four indicators of a reduction of social isolation of seniors. That's help and support when needed, regular participation in meaningful activities, and the seniors feel connected to and valued by their families and friends. In early 2017, we conducted a population baseline survey of seniors 55 and older across Edmonton. We'll be repeating that uh, survey in a couple of months. And our initial data was shared with the uh, uh, Smart Cities proposal team. Um, and it was also shared with Vital Signs, the annual checkup conducted by the Edmonton Community Foundation and the Social Planning uh, Council. Our shared outcomes, which we all worked on together, are to increase the awareness of seniors of, of, of social isolation and the organizations, programs, and services that can help to prevent, reduce, or overcome isolation, and to intentionally find low-resource seniors who are isolated or at a greater risk of isolation. We've been able to facilitate access to programs and services that have measurably improved social connection and quality of life. And we've helped to increase the capacity of a lot of organizations to collaborate. We have a very good evaluation team. They've been working hard to support the collaborative by looking at how we work together, what is it that we're learning, and helping out our project leads to make changes to their projects based on their learnings. This team is key to our understanding of the utility and impact of the collective impact model, pulling out and articulating our learnings and helping to apply these lessons to the development of future partnerships and collaborations. And in light of this morning's announcement by the federal government, that is going to be even more important over the next few months. Through the activities of our Pegasus partners, more than 6,000 seniors have been reached with connections to assisted rides, outreach, and case interventions, sessions, classes, and presentations. There's still an awful lot of work to do, and we're committed to building and strengthening the relationships with all stakeholders across Edmonton to make this an age-friendly city. And one of the key initiatives of the City of Edmonton is the Smart Cities Challenge. I'd like to introduce Katie Hayes and Thomas Ernst from the City of Edmonton to tell us more about Edmonton's Smart Cities proposal. All the way from the back. <laughs> Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for inviting us to be here today. Uh, my name is Katie Hayes and I do work with um, Open City and Technology at the City of Edmonton and I'm here to talk about our Smart Cities Challenge proposal um, and my colleague here, Thomas, is sitting at the back. So um, we're happy to, uh, to hear some thoughts from you guys either today or we'll leave our contact information so that you're able to connect with us at a future date. Um, but ultimately, um, I'm here to talk a little bit about the Smart Cities Challenge um, and how we're working with residents service providers and stakeholders to develop a final proposal in Infrastructure Canada's uh, Smart Cities Challenge. So I'll go into a little bit of history, so I, hopefully it will make sense what we're hoping to do, um, but I'm happy to answer questions again, um, either here today or um, through another channel um, by email or phone uh, at another time. So for Edmonton, being a smart city is about more than just adopting new technologies and encouraging innovation. Together we create and nurture a resilient, livable and workable community that rises to the challenges we face today, provides our residents with a joyful experience and embraces the opportunities of tomorrow. The city encourages all individuals, industries and academic sectors to work together as partners in our open innovation ecosystem and we're thrilled to be speaking to you today about how your thoughts and ideas can help inform the city's final proposal in Infrastructure Canada's Smart Cities Challenge. So in the fall of 2017, Infrastructure Canada issued a challenge to every community across Canada encouraging them to adopt a smart cities approach to improve the lives of their residents through innovation, data, and connected technology. Out of the 20 other cities in our category, Edmonton was announced as one of the five finalists in June, on June 1st, 2018. So we're currently in the category to potentially win 
$50 million uh, to implement our Smart City <laughs> program. Um, and that would be over a period of about five years. So we'd be gradually doing more and more work over five years um, with the potential to use $50 million of federal funding. So we're now currently in our finalist round for which we need to finalize our submission, um, which is a plan. So we have to, we we're putting together a plan ultimately um, that leverages the um, aspirational application that we put forward uh, initially to make it into the finalist round. Um, and improve the lives of our residents through using a smart cities approach. So I'm going to read to you our challenge statement. It's very, it's quite lengthy and aspirational, um, and then I'll explain kind of a little bit more about what it means. So our challenge statement is, Edmonton will lead the transformation of Canadian healthcare using an unprecedented municipal approach by focusing on leveraging partnerships, health data, and innovative technologies to provide a personalized health connection and experience as unique as the health of every Edmontonian. Uh, so what does that really mean? Um, and for us, uh, with the Smart Cities Challenge, um, we're ultimately proposing that municipal level intervention will be very impactful on Canada's healthcare system and can improve the quality of life for residents. So we're not proposing moving into the sphere of being a healthcare provider, but we're saying that a lot of what we do as a municipality can transform the way our residents are just healthier in general, which then puts less of a strain on our healthcare system overall. So in order to improve quality of life for residents, we're focusing on increasing connectedness and sense of belonging while decreasing loneliness in our city. And our initial proposal, and this will continue into our finalist round, um, focuses on both senior and newcomer populations, as we understand that they face significant challenges when it comes to being isolated in an urban city. So moving on. Um, fundamental to our approach is building a healthy city ecosystem. So we will do this by partnering with other orders of government, local organizations, educational institutions, business and residents to use connected technology and data to improve the lives of Edmontonians. We intend to work collaboratively with residents and our partners to provide integrated, community-based support where we can learn about the challenges that our city is facing and work together to solve them. So that's number one. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, the following aspects that feed into um, the effectiveness of our healthy city ecosystem. And that is investing in devices and infrastructure, so the physical mechanisms that residents use to access services at times, locations, and in languages that are convenient to them. Investing in digital tools, which would be the platforms um, that would allow people to access uh, a large number of services, um, identify additional services, relationships or technologies that uh, would help them live healthier lives, as well as building a data repository. And that would encompass uh, data from our organization, data from partners, um, in order to really understand what's happening in communities, identify gaps, and be able to build solutions based on that. Um, so we've also engaged a data security and privacy expert to be part of our team to ensure that we establish a clear and transparent process for gathering and using data that does align with the highest privacy and security standards. Right. Um, so one of the reasons we're here today and um, we're speaking to community in general is because um, our proposal does need to be informed by residents as well as service providers and other stakeholders um, because we know that the city of Edmonton is not able to do something this aspirational alone. And so we want to make our proposal as relevant um, and as effective as possible so that we can hopefully win $50 million to be able to implement some really, really great things for our community. So in phase one, which is when we built our original application that led us to being a finalist, we heard from residents that they want to transform how city services are delivered. They want to become healthier and more engaged in their communities and they have a desire to create a sense of connectedness that empowers them to support each other. And so that really speaks to our theme of, of working together across sectors, building non-traditional partnerships um, to really work together to, to solve our city's problems. Uh, we also learned about some barriers that Edmontonians are facing in achieving those outcomes, um, and that's access to services, our urban sprawl, um, as well as uh, which can be in, uh, our winter climate. So today, in phase two, we're looking at engaging on these three topics primarily. And so we want to understand what makes residents feel connected. We want to understand how they use technology and whether it's a barrier to connecting or whether they use it um, as something that is a tool to actually connecting together. 
Um, and we also want to know what residents' privacy and security concerns are regarding the collection and use of data so that we can best develop a framework that's going to address those concerns as well as meet the standards that are set out through uh, regulatory bodies. And so, um, as I mentioned, so we're asking residents what makes them feel connected, how they use technology, and what data and privacy concerns they have. Uh, we're doing this, right now we have online a website survey um, that asks people how to share what makes them feel connected. And we know that a website survey isn't accessible to everyone, um, so we are able to provide paper copies. So if your organization does work directly with individuals who'd be interested in filling out a survey, we can provide you with paper copies to do that. Um, in January, we're hoping to put together or have a survey ready and out in the pub in the community that talks about technology use uh, and data and privacy concerns. And so again, that would most likely be hosted initially on an online platform, but we're happy to provide paper copies to anyone who may be able to use them within their uh, client base. And then lastly, um, oh, so that's that's residents. Um, when it comes to working with service providers, and one of the reasons that we wanted to speak, be able to speak to you today is we want to understand the challenges that are being faced in the communities you work with and your ideas on how we can work together to solve these systemic problems. And so we're hoping to, again, uh, survey a lot, um, but put together a survey for service providers um, that would allow us to deep, dig deep into the sectors that you work in and understand what the, challenge, the primary, primary challenges that are being faced and your ideas for how we can work together to, to solve them as well as we're hoping to host a session in the new year that would allow um, anyone that works in the nonprofit social service sector to be able to come learn about what we've heard from residents and what we've heard so far and how we're using that to frame our proposal. So we would invite you to that as well. And once we have more details, we'll send along the invite. We're targeting the civic tech community to learn about new approaches to using information and technology to improve our city. And then we're also reaching out to the private sector to understand and explore the possibilities and potential of partnerships that exist there. So ultimately, this information that we're gathering right now is going to inform our final proposal. And our, as I mentioned before, our final proposal is effectively a plan, that if we were to win the money, this is what we would do with it. And so throughout that plan, uh, it needs to incorporate an engagement strategy for the duration of the five years that we would have the funding. So not only do we want feedback today on what we think our plan should be, we also have to build into that uh, an engagement structure that's going to work for us continuously throughout this. So it isn't that we build a plan and it's set for five years and we're not going to change it. So we want to be proactively engaging with the community and with service providers and all of our stakeholders throughout the duration of the five-year funding cycle. And so we're also wanting to hear from you the best way to continue to engage with you throughout that duration and how we work towards evaluating the success of what we're doing and have that feedback into the work that we're going to continue to do. So my ask of you is, uh, and everyone we see is a lot, um, but we're hoping that we can get as much feedback as we can throughout the next few months as we build uh, towards, and I don't know that I mentioned, but our proposal is due in March, March 5th. Um, so that's what I have for this one. And so lastly, what we're ultimately going to do as we consolidate all of these engagement efforts um, is we're working to identify those municipal levers that would inform potential changes to policy programs or services that will directly impact the, the quality of life of Edmontonians. So we're doing research um, academically and just in uh, across the world about what other communities are doing, and then we're using that engagement to inform this. And so we identify those opportunities that exist within the municipalities uh, purview where we can make those changes that are really going to positively impact uh, the quality of life for our residents. This last slide is my contact information as well as Thomas's, um, as well as our website and our Twitter. So you can follow along our progress on Twitter. Uh, you can check out our website, which has our entire first round proposal in it. So if anything I said today didn't really make a whole lot of sense, it is a really good read that allows you to, to put this into context. Um, and you can also fill out our, our web tool that's a very short survey that just asks you what makes you feel connected. Uh, and then lastly, yes, follow us on Twitter for our progress. Our website is also periodically updated as we work through uh, updating things and building towards our final proposal. And then our email addresses are here, so you're welcome to connect with us um, about your ideas now, or, you're welcome, or, or you can wait and we will definitely be circulating surveys um, beyond that. So we hope to hear from you either way, whether it be personal this way, um, or just by filling out um, one of our surveys.